Well, hello, everybody. My name is Monty Worthington. I'll wait for my presentation to come up here, but I'll give a little brief introduction. Um, as Joel mentioned, I've been working in renewable energy for about 20 years. I was born, well, not born, but I lived in Alaska my whole life um, since I was six months old. And I've um, been working in tidal energy for over 10 years now, um, primarily for Ocean Renewable Power Company, but I did start um, working in what we call marine hydrokinetics in a river on a river project while I was working for the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council back in, in uh, 2007. Um, and something I'm really passionate about is just bringing awareness to Alaskans about the incredible ocean resource that we have here in this state. Um, Alaska really is considered the ocean energy state uh, when you look at, it this, look at this at the national level. Um, we have over 97% of the identified tidal energy resource in the country, 50% of the wave resource, and about 20% of the river resource. And these all fall within what we call the marine hydrokinetic um, field. All right, so here we go. I have the presentation up. Um, obviously a great quote from Arthur C. Clarke, and something that I think Craig's figure about the how many cubic kilometers of water out there in the ocean was pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, it really is an ocean planet we live on, and a lot of the energy on, in the Earth is, is in the, contained in these oceans, and it's not the first being terrestrial creatures, it's not the first place we look, but it's a place we're starting to go with both offshore wind and marine hydrokinetics, and the potential is, is enormous out here in the oceans. Um, this is something I always like, this is a picture from uh, False Pass um, at the end of the Alaska Peninsula between the end of the peninsula and the first island there. And it's probably the most robust ocean energy resource we've identified as a company. And it, this image just kind of reminds me of the raw energy that's out there in the, in the oceans, this, the currents that flow through this pass where the Bering Sea and the Pacific first meet. And the, the winds that howl through this area just remind me that there's so much energy out here in this state that we don't yet harvest effectively. And, and we're still working to, to figure out solutions, especially for these remote communities. And, and this is, our, our company first came to Alaska because of the tidal energy potential we see in Cook Inlet. But, and I'll we'll talk a bit about that later, but we quickly pivoted to look at the remote communities because of the high cost of power we see in these communities. Um, I just finished a river trip this weekend. I ended up in a village, um, Kayana, on the Kobuk River. And typically, you know, it's a, a diesel-powered community. And while it's a real reliable energy resource, there's a lot of downsides to this this fuel source, both environmental risk and cost to these communities and all the infrastructure required to maintain it. But like almost all of our communities, it sits on a river, very big river, the Kobuk River. And there's only a couple communities in Alaska that aren't either on the coast, where there is pop potential wave or tidal resources, or on rivers that are large enough for salmon to swim up. There's just, I think, Anaktuvik Pass and maybe one other village that aren't located on, in, on fairly large bodies of water. This map shows sort of the cost of energy and size of communities and, and a little bit of an overlay of some of the resources on the marine hydrokinetic side that are there. So this is where our company, ORPC, pivoted and started looking at these communities. And the one that we've really partnered with and is sort of our flagship project in Alaska is Igiagig on the Quijack River. That's a picture of the outlet of Lake Iliamna and the beginning of the Quijack River there as it flows down to Bristol Bay. And we did a demonstration project there in 2014 and 2015 with what we call our RivGen turbine. And this is a picture of it in 2015. We supplied up to a third of the energy to the community from this hydrokinetic resource in the river. This is the turbine as it sits on the surface. In operation, it sinks to the riverbed where it generates electricity from those turbines harnessing the river currents. And we see this as a value proposition to our community partners in a number of ways. Um, one of them being that we are trying to figure out a more um, cost-stable, environmentally sensitive solution to energy as opposed to diesel. And another is to create economic development at the local level. Rather than just buying fuel for the energy, we worked with local contractors in, in the village and local operators of boats, of terrestrial equipment, and to really create that economic development so that the money that is being spent on energy isn't all just leaving the community, it's supporting local jobs, supporting local economic development. And th this has proved really effective with our partners in Nigiagig, and they're, they're, we're moving forward to install a year-round project there starting in the spring of 2019. It'll probably go in sometime in June, and we're moving forward 
to develop that turbine, build it, and get it out there next summer. But I did want to, since we're here in Anchorage, I wanted to talk a bit about sort of the bigger picture of the potential for tidal energy, particularly in Alaska, and the reason our company came here in the first place, so RPC I haven't spoken much about, is a Maine-based company, and I work for them here in Alaska. This is a picture of the East Foreland. It was taken about this time of year, maybe four or five years ago while I was down there, and those waves you see out there are standing waves created, they're the winds blowing from the north and the tides coming in, but it really, it's hard to see the currents moving a picture, but in that one you can really get a sense of the amount of water that's moving through there. It's an incredible resource. And something that we had, have done extensive study of. Um, this is a, a image of some modeling that was done at Georgia, Georgia Tech Research Corporation along with some data that NOAA fed to them. But essentially, this shows where the, the sort of power is concentrated in the inlet. And they identified that there's up to 18 gigawatts of potential power in the inlet. That amounts to about 120, 120 terawatt hours of energy annually. And to put that in perspective, um, the whole rail belt uses about a little less than seven terawatt hours a year. So we're talking about a resource that's very much at scale with, with the energy we use in this state. Um, looking at the national level, we, the country uses a little over 4,000 terawatt hours. So even at that scale, this is significant resource, but certainly enough energy to supply the majority of our needs if we're able to effectively harness it here in the state. And we, our company has looked at two sites extensively here. One is just off Fire Island. And both of these sites, I should say, are within about a mile and a half of existing transmission and identified that as a robust resource. And that is a, a sort of close up of the modeling effort there. And the other one that we're more active on now is at the East Foreland. And we're working with a partner, Homer Electric Association, on continuing a joint development agreement to do some R&D and eventually develop a demonstration project here. But both of these sites are not only good resources, but they're close to existing infrastructure and between them could, could be a significant build out of uh, tidal energy in the inlet. So I want to take a uh, moment to talk just about the technology. Um, and this is a slide, I put this together probably five to 10 years ago, and I was looking at what tidal energy looked like five to 10 years before that, and it really was just a bunch of cool pictures on the internet. And then this was what it looked like five to 10 years ago. All these things were being built and being tested. Um, and it was really proliferating. We're now kind of hitting a point in the industry where this proliferation is sort of starting to hit the, the large, what they call the valley of death. And a lot of these companies are not around anymore. Marine current turbines in the upper left was the darling of the industry at the time. And they were acquired by Siemens, but have since um, ceased to exist. Open Hydro in the lower right here was also one of the four leaders of the industry. And they just recently um, filed for bankruptcy. But some of these are still continuing to prove out. This turbine here, which wasn't one of the most lauded companies in the world at the time, just uh, crossed the three gigawatt hours of production. It's more power than produced by all these other turbines that were deployed in Scotland at the time. So there's successes, but they're starting to really winnow out the technologies. And our company has really benefited from the fact that we looked at the remote Alaska market. What really brought a lot of these other bigger companies to their knees was they tried to get to scale so quickly, yet their costs were too high to really develop commercial projects. So those, you know, the marine current turbine you saw was a, seemed like an excellent technology and it did work, but they couldn't make a case for developing a project because their costs were too high. We started looking at smaller turbines. So our RivGen is really the first commercial product we're gonna build and it's designed for remote communities where costs of power are high and we're able to com compete at a smaller scale there. And eventually we do see utility scale tide gens, something that we might see in the inlet someday. But that, is, that will be after the benefit of, of iterations of these smaller technologies. And in the meantime, you see the ATGU there is an autonomous turbine generator unit that's even smaller still. And that is something that we see lots of applications for in, in areas like um, oil and gas in defense where we're looking at um, charging, underwater charging stations and the ability for these units to self-power themselves and, and locate themselves where they need to be. So we've actually gone not just for the large scale, but also for smaller scale things as well. And I just want to touch base on a couple of these technologies here. Um, the RivGen power system, we are just finalizing design and beginning build of this, and this should show up in Alaska sometime next April and will be deployed in Igiagig in June, and this, this will be a year-round deployment, uh, similar size to the prototype we demonstrated there, 2014, 2015, but um, 
it is uh, much more efficient and produces about twice as much energy and should supply about half of the community's energy needs. And then this is the next technology we'll be deploying. This will actually be deployed in Quebec sometime next year also. And this is a community scale tidal power system that will ultimately be destined for the, the north of Quebec in a uh, community called Kujwak. Uh, uh, and it's a native community in the north of Quebec there. But it's larger than the Rivgen, but, but still um, more, more targeting that community scale rather than the large utility scale projects. And this has really become central to our company's business plan. As you can see here, the aqua color in that, in that, in that graph is the remote communities. And that is really what allows us to start to penetrate the larger utility scale grids, which is the navy color in that, in that graph. But without that, those remote communities in that market, we wouldn't really see a path ourselves to commercialization. But those higher cost market and the value proposition we have for them really gives, allows us to continue to develop our technology while solving energy issues for these, these smaller communities and allows us to grow to scale as a company. Uh, I just wanted to close with, a, with our mission statement. It looks like it doesn't all fit on here. Um, it's a lot of words. Um, you, can, you can read them there. But um, you know, essentially, as a company, we're really trying to partner with our customers, whether it's communities or industrial partners, provide meaningful solutions for them that address their energy issues, um, and not only on an economic basis, but also an environmental basis as we begin to value the, the sort of embedded costs of the energy and how we get it um, around the world. So thank you very much, and that's all I have. <laughs>